was a. What did you do? <laughs> um, we sort of feel it's it's sort of funny being Olympians, especially summer Olympians, because every four years you get dusted off, pulled out of the um, closet, and then sort of walked around a little bit and stuff. Um, but in putting a talk together, you never really know what the audience wants to hear, and so we sort of did a broad base that, um, about our philosophy, which it really, it, it wasn't about the Olympics, it was about the journey and getting to the Olympics. Um, Cause you know, you hear different stories from people about how they're so myopic about getting to the Olympics and that's what they want to do, like Katie and stuff. And that's one way of going about it. And Annie's and my way of going about it was just year by year. And like each year was like, each year we made it was like, wow, we made it. And it's like, okay, we're gonna try and go again and just sort of see what happened. And just by chance, we were fortunate enough to, to make it. So we're gonna talk about our, you know, briefly about how we got into rowing, which is, is somewhat special in a way because when I was coaching, I jokingly called rowing the United States of sports because it takes anybody, especially when you get to college, as long as you have a certain height and then um, cardiovascular and strength and then you know you can take it as far as you want so there's any number of athletes that actually start in college and take like annie that take it uh, take it the distance and so um, as long as you take the skills from other sports and have the cardiovascular and the mental drive so annie's going to start with her story and then we're just going to bounce back and forth and then at the end, I know there's a question. I know Brian has a question about performance enhancing drugs. Um, I got it. Can you, you answer it. this? Because yeah. she's called twice. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry, our daughter is riding courses in Larkspur, and that's her trainer. So it might be important. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to take it back. So uh, can Katie, no. can you do? I don't think so. Here we go. Okay, and yes. I think we can We're on. okay so how we found rowing Fred has already discussed this we can go one more to the first photo um, <laughs> so I'm gonna take it back to my journey to find rowing I was born and raised in steamboat that's the house we still live in this is my mom right there <laughs> tootling around um, so I basically grew up on skis okay, we're, we're gonna go through these pretty quickly I grew up doing little toots, which was kind of a precursor to Winter Sports Club at the time. Um, I grew up marking ski jumpers on the hill, surrounded by aspiring Olympians, basically. Um, doing the Winter Carnival street events, living the full steamboat experience. Okay, let's stop here for just a second. Um, when I was six, I retired from skiing because I wanted to ride. So this is my first little pony. And we can go one more. And I wanted to take that to the Olympics. I was surrounded by all these skiers and Nordic and Alpine and jumpers and stuff. Um, and, but what I really loved was horseback riding. So that's what I really pursued for a number of years. I did um, race with Winter Sports Club. You go another one. All through high school. One more. I was the Winter Carnival Queen. I was the <laughs> Carnival Queen. <laughs> one more. Okay, there. But um, when I went off to college, I got into Dartmouth, which was my dream. And um, I planned to ski at, in college. And then sophomore year, take my horses out. and. I had met with an Olympic level rider who was just across the Connecticut River and I was gonna be his working student and go to Dartmouth and like, that was my plan. Um, but I really didn't want to do dry land training, which if any of you are familiar with ski racing, that's what you do to get fit for on snow. Um, and I wanted to try something really different, something very East Coast Ivy League whatever and my cousin who is a very high level nordic combined um athlete here we grew up together his name is dana he had gone to school just outside of boston for a couple of years in high school and he had tried this sport rowing and he came back with stories and this is actually he and i on stagecoach oh. reservoir so this is a few years later but um his 
stories about rowing were kind of what opened my eyes to this other sport that I wanted to try. Um, so we can go one more. So when I got to Dartmouth, um, I walked on to the rowing team. I lied about my height <laughs> to, get, to be eligible. Um, I was terrible. The head coach that was taking us for the first few weeks, because my coach was at the 88 games and coming back, made me row an eight by myself in a circle because I was so bad. <laughs> um, but by the end of the fall, um, we had done some physiological testing and stuff like that, and my, my coach, who had returned from the Olympics, sat me down and she said, Annie, I understand that you're gonna ski race, that's your plan for this winter, but if you do that, you likely will not make a racing boat in the spring. If you decide to row through the winter, it's highly likely you'll make a racing boat in the spring. And so I decided to not ski at Dartmouth. In fact, I've never been to the Dartmouth Skiway, which is two miles from campus. <laughs> um, I decided to give rowing a go. And basically, that was the beginning. That was a door that opened for me that um, really opened up a lot of opportunities. Um, yeah. So if Fred's going to talk about his story. Forward. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's me <laughs> in the middle. Um, <laughs> so like, like I said before, like rowing is a sport that you, Sorry. that sometimes, you know, yeah, you uh, that sometimes you find by accident. And so my story is like my high school in um, just north of San Francisco was Redwood High School. And my freshman year, my dad and my brother both played basketball in, in high school, and then in my, my dad in college, and my brother a little bit in college. So that was sort of the trajectory that I was on as well. A friend of mine and I were walking down the hall in school one day, and, and there's the rowing team, and they're picking people out and stuff. And so my friend says, oh, let's, you know, I'm gonna try this rowing thing. You should do it with me. And I'm like, well, and so I went into the thing, I started, started the process so I was gonna stay in shape for for basketball through rowing through rowing and then um, and then I'd play basketball in the winter and then row in the spring and a year or two later my friend had quit um, I had continued on and then what really sort of set my set the stage for me going staying into rowing was I was playing basketball my junior year I got pulled up to the varsity uh, we went into San Francisco to play this inner city team and this guy who was like 6'9 was just dunking all over me. And I could outrun him back and forth on the court, but he just, you know, I just remember the coach at a timeout going, you gotta stop this guy. And I'm like, God, are you looking at this guy? Like, there's no way. So anyway, by the end of my junior year, I decided that, uh, you know, rowing was gonna be sort of the thing that I pursued going into college, but still, it wasn't something that I had set on, like the Olympics were not my set goal at that time. So I got to college, I went to a junior college in Southern California. I think you can go to the next one. Um, um, and started rowing down there and started doing really well. And then um, was recruited by uh, the coaches at Brown um, University of Washington and University of California, Berkeley. Um, I ended up going to Berkeley because of, um, it was an in-state school and the cost at that time was awesome. It was 750 bucks a semester. Hi, how are you? Um, go ahead, come on in. Should we start over? If you don't mind. Every time somebody Yeah, you gotta start. <laughs> um, wow. Oh, Cho, how are you? I um, seem very appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. I, I, I didn't know you were in this end. No, that's all right. <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, see you over there. Thanks. Good to see you. Well, that's good. Did you see him? That's what we said. Yeah, he's very comfortable. I want to sit by you, Joe. <laughs> this way. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I um I 
graduated from Berkeley, and at that time the team wasn't doing very well. Although I had done some some things individually that were were looked at very highly upon the national team coaches, the team itself didn't do well, and I had sort of in the back of my mind that that result was more indicative of what my abilities were. So I, I stopped growing, got a job, and then the recession hit in 92, and I remember watching the 92 Olympics, and there were two guys that I had trained with at Orange Coast College and at, um, and at high school, and they were at the, at the games, and I was like, I think I can do it. And so just by serendipitous luck, um, a coach, there was a club in Philadelphia. So I packed my truck up, quit my job, and went across the country not really knowing what was gonna happen. And I just sort of looked at it as, you know, the, the jobs were, there were many jobs in San Francisco, so I might as well go be poor in Philadelphia and try and really, you know, live a dream out. So that's how I got into it, so. Um, do you want? Okay, yeah, yeah, let's, uh, can you go, actually, we kind of got off, this is supposed to be talking about the intensity of training, which is a little bit later, but can you just go to the next one? Talk through oh, yeah, your yeah. first years yeah. on So <laughs> there was a so in '93, um, the way that training works in the national team is you you get a you find a pair partner. So it's like a it's like a dating scene. So you go into a club, <laughs> like a rowing club, and <laughs> not a dancing club. not a dancing club, <laughs> a rowing club, and then you start like going out with people who row on different sides because there's port side and then there's starboard side. And so you're like, you, you're basically trying people out to see. And so by chance, uh, this, this guy, Don Smith and I, um, we, we got into a pair one day and it just took off. And it's sort of funny, like I had this journal and it was like meeting the girl of my dream. I was like, <laughs> rode with Don today and it was amazing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I hope he likes me as much as I like him and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, as it turned out, like, you know, we, we were the top pair um, in 93 and um, made it into the, the US 8 and we won a bronze medal in, at the 93 games. And then going into 94, it was sort of like there were people from the 92 Olympics coming back. And so I'm like, well, that was fun while it lasted and stuff. But Don and I continued to row together and then uh, 94, um, our eight won the world championships. Um, and so that was just, that was just another piece of the pie of just having a really good time and being around a lot of really good guys and just having a lot of fun and stuff like that. And they didn't just win the world championships, they also broke the world record. And that was in Indianapolis, which there are not that many rowing events, elite level, world class in the US, but worlds that year were, and then the Olympics that we get to in a bit were as well but you can go to the next. So I'm just gonna step back. Oh yeah, that's when we met too. I mean, started <laughs> 93, 94. But anyways, can you just go one more? We wanna know more about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> you can ask questions along the way or at the end. But, um, so just going back, I'm sort of gonna bring my story up now to national team stuff. Um, after my freshman year at Dartmouth, I, um, was invited to a U.S. rowing development camp that Fred had also been invited to, but he decided not to go. So we might have met a couple years earlier, but I did meet his pair partner that, at that camp. Um, but anyways, it, another huge learning experience in terms of rowing the sport and all sorts of things. Um, I also had a very high level riding certification that I came home to after that rowing camp, riding meaning horses. And I was training for that riding certification in Carbondale, where I used to spend my summers um, competing and stuff. And the woman who was coaching me at the time, I was asking her advice because I still had planned to bring my horses out east to pursue my dream to the Olympics. And um, she said, Annie, you can ride when you're 50. You should row now. And so that was, that is what really, then I was all in on rowing. Um, when I graduated from Dartmouth, I gave myself a year after, the, um, after graduation to try and make the national team. 
The timing was really good because I graduated in 1992. It was an Olympic year. After the Olympics, a lot of the amazing athletes that are at the Olympics take some time off. So the up and coming ones, it sort of opens the doors. So my timing was exactly like Fred's, except I went to Boston with my pair partner. It was not quite as amorous a relationship. <laughs> um, but I did respect her and she is really, her drive was what kept me going um, because it was really hard. Uh, to be training on your own, not having a clue if you were even remotely in contention. Um, and rowing a pair is really hard too, and it's lonely, and it's cold, and... Um, but anyways, I also made the 93 team, like Fred did. Um, we both traveled to Duisburg. No, we, yeah, we both traveled to Duisburg that year, which is in Germany, that was our first international race. And then the World Championships was just outside of, the Ch of Prague in this small town that had both a paper mill and a pig, Ranch. not factory, yeah. So depending on how the wind blew <laughs> on the starting line for the world championships, you were either getting this crazy paper mill, eye-watering smell, or this pig stench. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that was our first world championships. I ended up racing in two boats, the four and the eight, and we got silvers in both, which was pretty exciting for the US women at that time. Um, the next year in Indianapolis, which again, that was when Fred won, um, I again raced in the four and the eight and got silvers in both. <laughs> and then this is our boat in Finland in 1995, and they, they, Four had been dropped from the Olympics at that time, and so we focused on the eight, and we actually won the World Championships this year. Um, and like Fred has alluded to, the team is picked each year. So you don't know if you are actually going to make the team until about June of each summer. Um, so you are invited to train with the main training center or not, so that's a good in indicator if you're still in contention. But you, it's not just eight people training for an eight, it's 16 people, so every year is a question mark. So really every year we were just taking it one day at a time to see if we'd make it. Um, so even though I have talked about how the Olympics was my dream, I didn't really know if that was going to be my full path until after this race and you basically, our entire, my entire boat said, yeah, we're going to try for it because we wanted to try and make the strongest team possible. Um, so uh, you can go to the next. I just want to point out that the, um, in 93, Annie, 1993, Annie and I were not we didn't, so we're really, not, we didn't really we didn't know each other. Talk to each other. And the, uh, <laughs> I just want to point out the pig smell and the, uh, and the, uh, paper mill. the paper mill. So after the Worlds, you got some time off. So a group of guys, we traveled around Europe and uh, on a, pretty much on a penny. And we'd go to these clubs to, you know, to dance with and try to meet girls and stuff. And, <laughs> We now know why no girls would hang out with us because the pig smell and the paper mulch smell and all our clothes because we didn't get to wash our clothes except in the, in the um, um, So moving on to 96, now you, you sort of know uh, an overview of like how we, we got into it, which is completely you know different, me rowing in high school and getting into it in college. Um, you know, leading up to the Olympics um, for us, it, it it's every four years, and so it becomes a it, it becomes more myopic of a, an event. And so you start to get things like Annie Leibowitz coming to the the boathouse. You know, our coach our coach who was this little British guy. You know, go oh, tomorrow we're going to have this photographer. She's going to come take photos of you for something or whatever. And we're all like, okay, some paper or something. And, in comes Annie Leibowitz for this book that she's doing on the Olympics and all the different athletes and stuff. And so she ended up getting into the bow seat of the eight and take pictures. And I was the two, I was fortunate enough to be the two seat. So 
a lot of the pictures you got were of my back and stuff, so my better, my better side. So, I mean, and so like for a lot of us, I mean, Bob Kaler being the, well, actually those, um, Jeff and Sean, these two guys, they ended up not making the eight. Um, Bob was the only guy who, from the 92 Olympics to, to make it into the eight in 96. And when you're going into the Olympics, there, you know, like the years before, there's some notoriety to it, but like when you get to that Olympic year, there's so much um, more notoriety. You know, the local papers are coming to town. You know, Andy Leibovitz, um, you know, met George Steinbrenner. You just have these people coming into the training centers, and you're just like, oh, and there's Michael Johnson and stuff. And so you start to get, you know, your head starts to go, oh my God, like this is this is just unbelievable. And so I, you know, our performance. I sort of attribute to not really handling the pressure, the the notoriety and stuff, um, you know, because that that was part of the thing that you know, as Annie got into coaching, the head coach Tom Terhar did a great job of just not letting the notoriety get to the athletes, and because that's one of the things that a lot of people don't know how to manage, and we obviously did not know how to manage it. So. Well, and Fred's jumping ahead to like London for that comment because my coach also did not handle it well for '96. Um, like we were on the cover of Time, we had all sorts of publicity that we weren't used to, and it definitely got into certain athletes' heads in the boat, mm -hmm. and we lost our cohesiveness a yeah. lot. Um, so. Let's, about training. Well, we missed that one. Well, if they want to know, we can go into that. <laughs> um, so we did. We made the Olympic team. Hey. Um, so I think that was that's sort of a given since we're giving this talk. Um, but the um, you know, and Fred talked a little bit about the stresses leading up to the Olympics. Um, the Summer Olympics is a huge deal. It's a huge event. And the Summer Olympics, any Olympics in your home country, is just, it gives you chills in when you're coming into opening ceremonies and stuff like that. Um, so just to give you some numbers quickly about Summer Olympics versus Winter Olympics. I mean, not that there's competition, but just so you can envision this. Um, the Rio Olympics in 2016, there were 11,238 athletes, 207 countries, um, 28 sports. In Tokyo, which was right after COVID, similar numbers, 11,500 athletes, 206 countries, um, 41 sports, a lot more sports. Um, they were trying a lot of sports and they had cut some out of 16. Um, the Winter Olympics, for example, Beijing, is 2,900 athletes, 91 countries, and seven sports, 15 disciplines. So when you're walking into opening ceremonies, and the reason why this picture, so this is my t a couple of my teammates and I, I'm a little on the short side, um, <laughs> but I don't know if you can see or later, but this is an aerial view looking down on the, field that we were, that all the countries, and the U.S. walks in last, and the whole place is just packed, like you could hardly move. There are so many athletes packed onto the field. Um, can you go to the next one? Um, this is Fred and I at opening ceremony. <laughs> um, so they keep you in this other stadium next door, and I actually got hit by a, a ember from a firework that was like the size of a marble because and we're just watching the opening ceremonies on a big screen just like you guys are watching it at home and we're sitting there in the heat in Atlanta sweating in our outfits <laughs> and um, I think we mostly had our blazers off but we had these white blouses that got really see-through um, <laughs> but then you know as the night progresses and you walk into the stadium you end up, up out on the on the field and it's just incredible um, uh, can you go to the next one do you want to talk 
uh, yeah, we the actual talk. racing. We can talk about training real quick. Let's just go through the race. Let's get through this. And we yeah, this painful. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
350 pounds, you want to do 352 pounds, you know, so it's everything was always just getting ramped up that way. And a lot of guys got, um, you know, who couldn't handle the, the training load. So Jeff and Sean, um, who I pointed out earlier, like they were two of the better rowers in, in our camp and they showed up out of shape, you know, because we had a, like a two or three month period where we were on our own. And in the Olympic year, they just got dropped. And so, so the guys that ended up being in contention for the eight in 96, there wasn't a natural stroke seat. Um, I'm not, I don't consider myself a natural stroke. So the stroke seat is based, is this guy here who sets the rhythm of the boat. And you know, then it, you build it out and typically the six through three are the power seats and then two and bow are the skill seats. Um, everybody's laying down power, but it, that's sort of how you want to build it out. And so all season we were trying out different guys in stroke seat of, the, of that, that core group. And so I basically became the guy who got put in that seat. So I was the last man standing, <laughs> got put in there. And you know, we, we ended up, we won the heat. We beat the Germans who ended up silver in the heat. Um, you know, we, we'd gone head to head with the Dutch um, who ended up winning and were a really talented boat. Um, you know, I always say for us, you know, not only did the pressure get to us, but like, you know, I, I called it swinging for the fence. We went out there and just were like, we, you know, in order to beat these guys, we got to go, you know, as hard as we can, as long as we can. And we just, we weren't in sync. We weren't in connection with, with one another. So that had a big part to play. So does that answer your question, Joe? Yes. Yes. I have many more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Was there oh, any other questions right now and then we'll just finish. What does the word discipline mean? Does that mean your sport? Well, so within rowing, there are a number of, there's the eights race, which is this. There's, so there's men's eight, women's eight. Each one of those are different disciplines. Um, there are fours, there are singles. So rowing has a number of disciplines. In ski racing, there's, slal in alpine ski racing, there's slalom, GS, downhill, um, what's the super G. Um, so that's, I think that's what they're referring to in terms of the number of sports, like when I was reading off statistics and stuff versus disciplines within those sports. So. Any other questions right now? Go ahead. Um, Okay, so uh, we, that's my dad, the same t-shirt. <laughs> I mean, this is not the same one. <laughs> um, so the thing about the Olympics for us is making the team was incredible. The opening ceremonies was incredible. Being able to, being a, having our coaches allow us to walk in opening ceremonies was actually amazing. Um, later, when we were coaching in London, the U.S. rowers did not walk in opening ceremonies because our racing is the first week. Mm -hmm. And so those coaches decided they wanted the athletes to be home, resting, well, not home, but um, in their rooms, resting, and stuff like that. But for us, it gave us a memory from the 96 Olympics that still gives me goosebumps, that opportunity, which is very nice because I don't think that that opportunity is what gave us our results on the race course. <laughs> um, I think had we not gone to opening ceremonies, we probably still would have had the similar results racing. And so it would have been quite disappointing all the way around. Um, when we finished, both of us took a step back um, because a lot of our friends went right back into training and they're like, nope, I need to win a medal at the Olympics. And for me, and for Fred too, although he may speak to this some more, it had been the journey. I mean, we had traveled all over the world and done amazing camps, met amazing people, had incredible teammates, great memories. We had pushed ourselves. Part of the whole adventure for me was to see how far I could push myself and like every, like what I came out of this whole experience with, what was, um, you have no limits. The, the incremental improvements get very small, but you keep improving. And it might not necessarily be 
in your scores, although they still keep improving, frustratingly small, but, um, but it can be in other strengths that you have. And so I really <coughs> came out of my Olympic experience feeling like the whole thing had been a huge success. The whole journey, I had gotten out of it what I had wanted to, and so with that, I retired and was, we went back and forth for a couple of years thinking, oh, maybe one will go back and then the other would be like, why would you do that? And the other one would be like, I'm kind of thinking about going back. And I'd be like, you're crazy. Um, but we both did step away from rowing. Um, and we moved back to Steamboat and I worked on the mountain and Fred worked at Nazola's cooking breakfast. Um, and no. did the biathlon, winter carnival, participated in winter carnival and all that. Um, so, and then pretty quickly, um, within a few months, I decided to go get a master's. I wanted to do a corporate life and experience all of that. And Fred got into coaching. Yeah, Hit on this because okay. they will yeah, be interested no. in this and then we can stop talking. You can go for it. Um, so, like rowing has been a there's been a big resurgence in rowing especially because of the book the boys in the boat and so and I, i'll talk to that so for a while after the book came out people would go oh did you read boys in the boat and, and i sort of had this i was a little standoffish about it and so i was like no i haven't read it and it took me a number of years to actually sit down and read the book so um and the and i don't want to the main reason is these are the these are the guys from the boys in the boat. In um, in '96, um, we got to go up to Seattle, and um, because it was their um, 60th, 70th, 60th, 60th reunion, because it was 36 and then '96. Um, the these are the remainders. That's Joe Rance right there. Um, we got to meet those guys. We got to talk with them, and you know. And it's sort of interesting because the only thing that we got out of their story was that they won a gold medal. We didn't know the backstory of Joe Rance and, and a lot of these guys and what they went went through. And actually our Cox and Steve, um, you know, when the movie was coming out and stuff, he's like, God, I really wish we talked to those guys a little bit more about their story, uh, to know a little bit more about them rather than just being so focused on the fact that they had a gold medal, which is what we were after. And so it was really, really, it was really cool to get to sort of know those guys, even sort of superficially. Um, you can move forward then. Um, I was then lucky enough to get the job at the University of Washington coaching, um, the freshman. And so as a freshman, you get your, your head shaved. Um, <laughs> before racing season, it's sort of like this rite of passage. And it had to do with the, something that the guys did in the book as well. Um, this is Roger Morris. And so a lot of like Joe Rance and Roger Morris in particular, they'd come to the boathouse every now and again, and Roger would go out in the in the launch with me, and we'd talk rowing and stuff, which was which was really cool. So, um, so again, like now knowing their story more because of the book Boys in the Boat, like rowing has taken this huge resurgence and stuff. And so I was just dumb luck that I was around and got to meet these guys and stuff. So, um, but coaching was great. Um, you know we. Annie started coaching at Oregon State. We co I coached at Washington, Oregon State. Then we went to the University of Pennsylvania, and then Annie was fortunate enough to get a job at, uh, with Tom Terhar at Washington. So, do you want to talk to that? Uh, just briefly, just a couple more minutes, and then we'll wrap up. But um, yeah, I um, I did my corporate thing for a few years and hated it um, <laughs> horribly. Yeah. I still <laughs> anyway, um, so I got into coaching. I coached novice women, essentially, um, which means at Oregon State I coached walk-ons. Very similar to me. Loved them. My first boat, I can remember, none of them had ever rowed before, and we took them to San Diego in the spring, so they, I had them all fall and winter. And they go out for their first run, they come back in and they're like, Coach, are we supposed to be here? <laughs> <laughs> and then they ended up getting third behind um, Cal and, Wa and uh, Washington at that race. But uh, then we moved to um, Philadelphia, 
and I coached at Penn, freshman women. And then I had the opportunity to assist with the national team because the head coach had been an assistant coach when I was an athlete. He was married to one of my teammates from the national team. And his other assistant was one of my teammates from the national team. And he brought me in to assist him with the athletes that were co training at the center, which had kind of been the role that I had been um, on a daily basis, but then also do athlete identification. So I got to do camps all over the US at the collegiate level to identify the next up and coming generation of rowers. Um, and I did that for five years. I would take all the collegiate kids, put a camp together, pick boats for under 23 world championships, We'd go to Europe, they'd race, we'd come back, I'd jump in with the senior team, with whatever boat that head coach Tom was giving me, prep for Worlds, we'd go off to Worlds, come back. It was um, a pretty amazing coaching situation. Fred left Penn and also started with US rowing, so we were both living this pretty cool coaching life. Um, and then I got to coach, we both got to go to London. Um, and the boat I was coaching got fourth. Um, that said, they came in as total unknowns. They had never raced internationally, so fourth for them, even though they regretted it immensely. For me, I was like, this is incredibly good. <laughs> like, you did a really good job. Um, but we also had young kids at the time, and that schedule is really difficult when you have young kids. So. Uh, soon after the London Olympics, we moved back to Steamboat, and we've been here ever since. Um, but yeah, and that's kind of our story with the Olympics, the Summer Olympics tied in. And like I said, the London ones, nobody got to walk in opening ceremonies. It was a very different experience. Mm -hmm. The women's eight won. I mean, they always won back then. Um, but it just, it was, it was interesting, because for them, that was the big deal. That's what they had to do, and, or it wasn't a success. So, um, and they also didn't travel as much as we did. So I reflect on their experiences versus ours. And I don't know if it, even though they were winning gold medals literally at every international regatta, I don't know how fulfilling their whole, whole experience was. But um, do you have anything else? No. With that, we can open it up to questions. When everything clicks in that eight, how fast do you think? How fast is that thing moving? You, you know that. To touch on that, like it, when you get into an eight, that's that's moving. Like the speed is like what 18, 17, 18 miles an hour. Um, they have videos of people pulling uh, water skiers um, up behind the back of the boats. But but it's not that fast. It's, but it feels. Yeah, but just the. the when, when the boat is just in sync, you know, the, in the book, Boys in the Boat, they talk about swing and the synchronicity and stuff. And that's the thing that, that really draws people back, you know, um, back to the sport, you know, just feeling the connection and the boat just, it's not like, it doesn't even feel like you're working. And that's, that's just, it, it's magical. And you, you know, you're always trying to find it. And when you find it, you're just like, I want, it's, I don't want to say it's like a drug, but it's like it's it's this endorphin that you get that's just it's just amazing. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like you're working, but it is brutal. I mean, yeah. rowing is one of the most physiologically demanding sports that is out there. So, like you are you start anaerobically in a race, then you go to aerobic, but full pressure, full power, full go, and then you go back into anaerobic at the end, and it is brutal on your body, um, and the training for it is is very hard so you definitely have to have the, the mental toughness and also the desire to push yourself into that so anything else yes this is not a question but i think you all did a wonderful job oh it's totally entertaining yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you yeah. and did you have a question yeah do you guys still keep up with what's going on in rowing now and like when we watch the olympics yes we do yes, yes we do <laughs> So, so I, we, we've been lucky enough to stay in the sport um, 
when we moved here, um, this, this is a boat company, so if you go back a few, the yellow boats is, is M. Hawker. And so um, I was lucky enough to, well, he called the guy, one of the owners, because when I was doing the yeah. team management. All of those, oh, sorry. all of the yellow ones are up All of the team management and stuff, um, you know, I worked with all the boat builders and stuff, and so they didn't have a representative in the United States. And so when uh, I called them up to tell them I was leaving U.S. Rowing, we're moving here, um, he said, oh, we need somebody for two years. And so it's been 11 years and <laughs> it's been a great business for us. But so. it means that we do stay very on top of what, who's, who's who in rowing still. And then interestingly enough, our son has started rowing against <laughs> our advice. <laughs> um, and he's That's out. tongue in cheek. Well, it was against our advice, right, that's but true. we're really happy he did. Um, and he currently is out in Philadelphia learning how to coach and row more oh. himself, which we just laugh about. So, yeah, so from- Yeah, so we, we I mean, we, we stay in touch with, with it and still a lot of our friends are involved in the sport and so, yeah. yeah. And yeah. actually a lot of the athletes that I was coaching are still rowing, not a lot of them, but a few of them are, especially the ones that I had identified at the college level and they were just starting to come onto the scene and they will be in the women's eight and four this year. So the four is back into the Olympics now. So. Yeah. You don't mind me asking, how old is your son? 19. Wow. Yeah. Well, I have an interesting question. Because you trained so hard for so long, is there an untraining protocol? There's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> My untraining was always to come home and live in steamboat. <laughs> and, uh, that so to that extent there is there you're supposed to detrain and decrease the amount of volume that you do um, because it can enlarge your heart the amount of work that you're doing and so you need to detrain so it doesn't turn to fat and stuff like that um, but yeah, a few examples of people who just stop. stop cold turkey and then go to business school or whatever and they're they become sedentary in their lifestyle, and then they have, heart they, they have heart attacks or heart issues and stuff like that. Yeah. So in a way, you have to sort of keep training. That said, we were just hanging out with this, one of my former teammates who, again, was the assistant coach for the national team for years, and we were laughing about how I would come home on breaks to Steamboat, and I would ski. I would ski a lot and hard, but that's what I would do, and then the coach would be like, oh, lady, what have you been doing? And I'd be like, uh, training. <laughs> I run hills occasionally, just so I could say something. And my my friend teammate, she was like, "Yeah, all Andy had to do was go move rocks around <laughs> because steamboat's so high, uh -huh. and really you don't want to train that hard at this altitude." So for us, we did conveniently come back to steamboat pretty soon after the Olympics, both of us, and lived here for a number of months, and we were active. Absolutely active, but not an official detraining thing. And I think that's largely what yeah, helped, helped us transition pretty well physiologically. Yeah. I have one question. When you speak about how moving the experience of the opening ceremonies, can you tell us about at the 1996 Olympics? the lighting of the cauldron. You're, you're good at that. <laughs> um, yeah, the lighting of the cauldron was pretty, spe like, you know, because um, all the athletes march in and then there's the, the, the lighting of the cauldron and stuff. And um, uh, I think, well, I know Janet Evans. Ran it in. And then she it ran it in and then she ran it up, then she ran it up the stairs. And She's handed, a swimmer, by the way. She is. Yes. Yeah, very <laughs> successful. Very successful swimmer. And um, she wasn't a great runner. No. <laughs> um, but she then handed the the torch off to Muhammad Ali, and that's when he was dealing with Parkinson's and stuff. And he stood up, and it was just one of those experience, you know. And he hit the torch, and it just went up, and it was just like, wow, well, you're. We knew we were there, but that was when. I think I really was like, holy, 
Yeah, it was huge I'm, for us on TV. I, I can't I'm, imagine. I'm here. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm at the Olympics. Is, well, in some ways, it's bigger on TV because they focus in. Like for us, it still was kind of far away. So in that sense, it's not right there in your face when you're there. Yeah. Um, but you get the whole the energy from the whole stadium when you're there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Sort of like sort of doing alpha omega here. <laughs> so you're like in the cauldron. Did either of you ever catch a crab and get thrown out of the boat? My teammate did. Like, and I saw her feet come right over in front of me. Neither of us did. No. I had um. We were in the middle of a, a heavy load volume, and so like that's it's funny when you go give talks at at schools and stuff, the, the kids all want to know these type of things, Joe. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, we were, we were in Switzerland training, and I mean, we were, we were, he was beating us up really good, and we were doing these high rating things in straight floors, and this, this guy, this good friend of mine, Mike Peterson, was in front of me, and he just, you know, it was raining or something, and he lost hold of the oar, oh. the blade went down into the water, and it came up and hit him right underneath the jaw. And the next thing I know, he's like, his feet are up, and his head's like in my lap, and he was completely knocked out. Oh. So I <laughs> tried to wake him up. And I was yelling at him, and I'm like, come on, we gotta get going, we gotta catch this guy. So that, we were in Australia, and we were doing really high rate pieces, like short, but super high rate. And we were in this cheap boat, I don't even know what it was, but it had plastic bolts holding our feet in. And my teammate, Amy Fuller, who was already an Olympian and stuff like that, caught a crab and literally her foot, her shoes, just the bolts broke and she just went bloop out of the boat and she was gone. <laughs> <laughs> she was fine, she didn't get knocked out. But so it was how high rate one. How many strokes of it? We were doing 50. I mean, it was working on just quickness stuff, but to the point of exhaustion, so that's why we were losing our coordination. When you pull out at the beginning of a race, does the boat come out too because of that power surge? What you, uh, the water? The, the water, yeah, when you all start the race. Um, it, yeah, there is, it's sort of, it's called porpoising, so the boat actually, when the boat's moving its fastest when you're at the release. So as right. soon as you've put all the energy into moving the boat, the boat will sort of come up and then it'll settle down as you're coming forward. So the boat will actually sort of be moving like this mm -hmm. uh, down the course. But you do, so... The goal I, is to keep it moving flat, but yeah. you can't do it. Yeah. Like, this is me, I'm in bow. So I am always in bow because I was four to six inches shorter than anybody else and up to 50 pounds lighter than some of my teammates. <laughs> um, so I was like always in the bow end. Um, and in that seat, when you're in bow and two, you can feel the boat pick up when mm -hmm. you are moving mm -hmm. as one. When, it's, when you reach that efficient sort of magic point um, you definitely feel like the boat has come up and out. And that's partly why those two rowers tend to be more technical because like you have to sort of feel the water. It's not just a mechanical right. going back and forth. So yeah, yes. You mentioned that you lie about your height. <laughs> I'm just curious, like what's the target that they're looking for? Like what's kind of the minimum height? That so when, like? when I started, which was a long time ago, it was 5'8". Now it's really 5'10", oh. what they're saying. So and at the, on the national team, I mean, my teammates were 6'3", 6'2", and 6'3". Um, the men are, Fred was small. I mean, yeah. they're 6'6", six, 6'8". Six, um, yeah. well, the guy, Don, who I talked about, he was 6'7". Yeah. I mean, most of the guys were like between 6'7", six, and 6'6". And, and, and the reason being is that leverage in the water is a big deal. Um, that said, there are plenty of very tall people that just don't, can't cut it in terms of toughness and stuff like that. I luckily have really long arms for my build, so I was able to match angles with the, the taller people. So, like, sometimes I was, I did row with 
Jen, who's 6'3", in a pair, and the two of us mm. could match up just because of how, like, how I'm built versus how yeah. she is. So, yeah. Um, and uh, I'm five, seven and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but I rounded up to five, eight. So <laughs> it's just a little play -like. Yeah. So, um, but it is getting taller. Um, and part of that is because it, at the collegiate level, the rowing scene has changed quite dramatically in the past 20, 30 years. Um, and so the pool of athletes is huge on the women's side of things, more so than on the men's, but yeah. Yep. But, well, thank you all. Thank you.